Because that sounds familiar too, doesn't it? I talked about that this morning. We are growing in Christ. And uh, thankful for that. Alright, John chapter 15. We're back here, but we're going to pick up where we left off. Um, I titled this, Love of Christ versus the Hatred of the World. Uh, as you read the end here of John chapter 15, and then you start to get into the first few verses of John chapter 16, the Lord is back on this topic of what's about to happen to them. Uh, and they are going to be faced with some rough times. And again, don't forget, his context to them so far has been, I'm the master, but I got down and washed your feet. You need to be willing to do that to each other. Love each other like I loved you. I'm leaving. Don't worry, I'm going to come back and get you and take you with me at some point. I'm sending a comforter. He'll give you peace. Things are going to get bad. Don't worry. Things are going to get bad. Don't worry. Right? It's, he, he goes back and forth with this message, and each time he adds a little bit more to it. I don't think it's a mistake either, by the way, that Jesus starts to talk about the hate of the world right after he has just wrapped up this conversation about, if you want to bear fruit, abide in me, abide in me. I abide in you, you abide in me, uh, I'm going to work on you, you're going to get better, you're going to bear more fruit. And by the way, don't forget, love each other, love each other, love each other. Matter of fact, verse 17 that we didn't read this morning says, These things I command you that you love one another. That's like the third time he said that in this chapter. And it's right after that statement in verse 17 of saying, These things have I commanded you that you love one another. It's no mistake that he says all of those things right before he gets into, By the way, the world is going to hate you. And it's not going to be good. And so what we want to talk about as we read, we're going to read verse 18 uh, all the way down through the end of chapter 15. And then we're going to read the first three verses of chapter 16. Okay? And these are some of the things we want to talk about. Why would the world hate us? We want to talk about the guilt of the world. We want to talk about the comforter is coming and will be a witness. And then what is coming and why tell us? So the Lord actually gives very specifics about when I say the world hates you, these are some of the things that the apostles and others throughout the last couple thousand years at different times have faced. And he tells them some of those things. And then he goes on to say why he's telling them those things. And then really, I don't know that we'll get this far, um, I want to ask the question, why are you being persecuted? And we want to, when we get that point, we'll actually spend probably more time in Peter than we do in John, but I think it's an important tie back to some things that Peter says when we start talking about persecution, okay? Um, too many times in this world, Christians want to claim everything that bad that's happened to them in their life is persecution because they're Christians. And that is not always true, right? And so we want to talk about some of that. Why, why are you faced with some of the things that you're faced with? And uh, we'll, we'll talk through a little bit of that as we get further down into this. I really don't think we'll make it that far today. We'll see how it goes. All right. John chapter 15, starting in verse 17. These things I command you, that ye love one another. If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember, the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin, but now they have no cloak for their sin. He that hateth me hateth my father also. If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin, but now have they both seen and hated both me and my father." But this cometh to pass, 
that the word which uh, the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law, they hated me without a cause. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he will testify of me. And ye also shall bear witness, because ye have been with me from the beginning. These things have I spoken unto you, that ye should not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. And these things will they do unto you, because they have not known the Father nor me. Now, some of this stuff, I think, is a prophecy of what's going to come within, not, within just a few months, potentially. Some of this is a prophecy of what's going to happen over the next few thousand years. Okay? Both of those are, I think, wrapped up in there. But he, 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 it's interesting, when you take this section, we start with love one another. By the world, the world's going to hate you. Don't worry, they hate you because they hated me first. It's not really you they hate, it's me they hate, and they hate my father. And then he goes through this stuff and he says, don't worry, I'm going to send a comforter. <laughs> how, how much comfort is that, by the way, if you don't have faith in what the Lord says? Things are going to get bad. They're going to kick you out of the synagogues. There's going to come a time where they're going to even kill you and think they're doing it in the service of God. But by the way, don't be worried. Uh, have comfort. I'm sending somebody to give you peace. You got to have faith in the one that's saying those things to be able to hear the fact that you're going to suffer but don't worry about it because I'm going to be there with you. That's kind of, a, if I was to summarize what we just read in just a few sentences, that's probably about as close as I could get. Love each other. The world's going to hate you because they hated me first and they hate my father and they don't know my father. It's going to get bad, but don't worry. I'm with you. Now, if you don't have faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, those words probably don't help much. What you heard was, it's going to get bad and I'm going to suffer. It's easy to miss the, I'll be with you, it'll be okay. And by the way, don't forget, in other passages he told us, don't fear what man can do to you. You need to fear what God Almighty does. Alright, so, why? Let's talk about why for a minute. Why does the world hate us? And understand... You know, we live, we live in, a, in a very free country, and we have not suffered the level of persecution that some people have. And, we and, we, and sometimes we think about, we just think about history, right? Well, yeah, back in the dark ages or back during this part of this history or that part of this history, or, you know, uh, Christians suffered. You know, there are Christians today that suffer some of these persecutions that we're talking about. There is such a thing as places and countries where they can't openly meet like we meet. And they meet underground. And if they got caught, they will spend time in jail, if not worse. That still happens today. We sometimes are so far removed from that, we don't grasp that. But it does. And it could come a time where it happens to us. We don't know. I know that when I go out among this world, especially here in the U.S., you know, people at least know Christianity, they understand it. There are plenty of people that don't hate us in the sense that we think of. They don't understand us. They think we're a little nuts. Um, but they may not hate us in the sense that they're trying to kill us. But I've also recognized the fact that even honestly through some of the coronavirus stuff, People's patience with each other is not near as long as we think it is. You can go from point A to point B in a relationship in this world pretty quick. And what is freedom today and no persecution today or just minor mockery, given the right turmoil and chaos and everything else, can quickly turn to hatred. If that happens to us, or in the places where it's already happening to us, to people, the Lord explains why some of this would happen. Why would the world hate us? He says in verse 18, If the world hate you, 
ye know that it hated me before it hated you. Now, listen, I can be a jerk, and I can be the worst friend possible, and people hate me because of it. That's not what he's talking about. He says, when there's people in this world that hate you because of you being a my follower, I want you to understand why. In other words, he said, it's not you, it's me. That's what he said. It's not you, it's me. You live your life after, my, after the pattern that I've set for you. I'm, honestly, he's saying, he's really saying, if you live your life after the pattern that I've set, I guarantee you there will be people in this world that hate you because of it. And you want to know why they're going to hate you? They're going to hate you because they hate me. If the world hated me and the message that I had and you carry my message, it goes to reason that they're going to hate you too. They hated him because they were in darkness. And, and as you think about some of the other places that we've read in John, he even talks about some of this, right? They hated him because they were in darkness. And he was the light. The nat and natural man loves darkness rather than light. That's some other things we learned as we went through this, right? They don't want their sins revealed. They don't want the glorious righteousness of God to be shown. They don't want that. They don't want to give up those things that they do in wickedness. They don't want the light to shine and to reveal their true nature and to have to recognize that, yes, I need something. It's like the people he talked to who claimed to be his believers and he told them they were in bondage to sin and their response was, we're in bondage to no man. They liked the fact that he could heal people. They liked the fact that he could turn... Uh, a little bit of food into a whole lot of food. But when he started talking about their sin, oh, wait a minute. We don't like this guy anymore. We also see here that Christ has chosen us. He'd already said that we didn't choose him, but he chose us. And it's like Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1, uh, starting in verse 4, according as he hath chosen us in him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us into the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. He says in verse 18, If, you were, if, if the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hated you. So he says, look, the world hated me because I'm the light shining on a dark place. You have been chosen by me and ordained by me, he said earlier. I've ordained you into good works. I've ordained you to carry my message. Because you're not of this world and you've been separated from it, you've been pulled out from it, and you've been given this task of carrying my message, because they hate me and because they hate my message, they will hate you too. You ever hear the phrase, don't shoot the messenger? Well, guess what? We've been called to be messengers of the Lord's gospel. And that gospel brings with it great hope. But that gospel also brings with it you are a sinner and need hope. And Jesus is saying, when you bring that message, don't be surprised when they shoot the messenger. But, but it's because in reality, when you boil it all down, they hate me. So he's chosen us out of this world. I'm going to say it this way too. As you think about some of the other passages, I think especially in Proverbs and Psalms and some of those places, they're going to hate us because we're not like them anymore. Do you know the lost, the person that's in sin? And listen, I'm saved. I'm not sinless. And so look, I can fall into some of these same traps myself. But I think you learn in Scripture that the person that's in sin, they don't want to be alone in the context of they don't want to be the only one that's doing this. Um, it helps when everybody around you is also doing these things. 
They hate us because we've been chosen and we've changed and now we're trying to walk in the light. I think about the people in Thessalonica and how they, after they were redeemed, they gave up worshiping all those idols. And they turned and they talked about the one and true living God. And their life reflected the fact that they were totally different now. But if you read much about the people in Thessalonica, you'll find that a lot of references to the fact that they were in suffering and that they did, they accepted the message in great um, persecution. It cost them. And it cost them because they abandoned the things of this sin in this life. And those around them, guess what, didn't like that. The guilty like to have other guilty around them. Others feel they have no sin and it angers them to hear. So some people will hate the message because they don't want to be the one still off in this stuff when everybody else has been able to, the Lord has changed their life and they're out of it, right? But not everybody reacts that way. Some people hate it because they don't want to admit they have sin. Honestly, that's the way that a lot of the Jewish ru rulers were. Back there in John chapter 8, I already referenced it once, right? They wanted to follow Christ. They, they wanted to be with him. They wanted him to be the king. They wanted him to be the Messiah. And then he started talking about how they needed truth, and the truth would set them free. And, and then he started talking about them being in sin, and sin, a bondage to sin. And no way. No, I have no sin. I'm not in bondage. It angers them to hear people say that they're in bondage, that they need a redeemer. They don't want to be brought to the point of needing to face what they really are. The Lord, in a way, gives us a way to not be hated by the world. You say, what do you mean? Verse 19. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. Do you not want to feel the anger and the hatred of an unbelieving world? Well, then be like them. If, if you don't want them to be opposed to you, then be like them. That's what he says. I mean, I'm not encouraging you to do that. But the statement, they wouldn't hate you if you were like them. Now, for those of you that go, hey, you know what? I don't want to be hated, so okay. Don't plan on that working out well for you either. Because they may not hate you in regards to hating the message that you carry. But I'm going to give you a little bit of a tip. The world is not great to each other either. The, the things that you will go through and the things you'll be faced with and the, all of the other stuff, well, they may not hate you because of your message anymore because you're one of them, you're part of them, you're acting like them. Don't expect that to work out well for you either. <clears throat> and I would also say that if you are one of the Lord's, it's not going to work out well for you for a couple of reasons. The world is not going to take care of you. And if you're the Lord's and you're acting like the world, he is going to chastise you. There will be some correction coming from him. If you're his, he loves you, and he will try to get your attention. So I'm not saying those things to say, go try to be like the world to avoid trouble, because it won't work. <laughs> It'll be different trouble. But if you don't want the world to hate you, well, just be like them. If you, want the, if you want to be what you should be, if you want to show the love of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you want to carry the message that he has given you, if you want to go out and tell people, look, I was lost, undone, guilty, vile, wicked, bound for hell, but the Lord Jesus Christ saved my soul and I'm not bound for hell anymore. And by the way, you are also lost, undone, sinful, bound for an eternity in hell. But the good news is, is the Lord Jesus Christ can save you too. Now, if people are the Lord's, that message will convict them. 
and the Lord will work on them and the Lord will save them eventually. If they're not the Lord's, they will hate that message. And eventually in some places and sometimes that hatred gets thrown back at the messenger. And he's giving them a heads up, right? He's told them, I'm leaving. I'm not going to be here. The Lord has actually protected them so much up to this point, right? But he's saying, look, I'm not going to be here anymore. And people are not going to like it. People are not going to like your message. They didn't like me. They're not going to like it when you say it either. I think you also see here they are doing it because they don't know the Father. He actually says in some of these verses that they don't know him that sent me. That's why. They hate me, they hate you, and they do that because they don't know him that sent me. Now I want you to think about the impact of those words. We're not talking only about the heathen Romans. Some of the people that the Lord is talking about are the religious elite of the day, the most studied in the law of Moses, the ones that sat in judgment when it came to the law over other people. And the Lord looked at his apostles and his disciples and said, when they kick you out of the synagogues and when they try to kill you, they're going to do it in the name of God. They're doing it because they don't even know who my father is. That's a pretty big statement. We kind of brush over it. But we're talking about people that who would have been appalled at the fact that you said they don't know the Father. I mean, some of them wore little tassels on their clothes and all these things and scriptures printed all over them. And the Lord says, they hate my message because they don't really know my Father. The guilt of the world. They're guilty. These verses talk about them having no sin as you looked at it. And I want to make sure we understand what we're saying here. As you read these verses, right, he says, The world hateth you. In verse 20, Remember the word that I said unto you, The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. In verse 22 it says, If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not, uh, they had, not had sin, but now they have no cloak for their sin. Now understand, Jesus Christ here is not saying that if he had not came and spoken unto them, that they would have been innocent and without any natural sin and therefore would have died eventually and went to heaven because they were innocent. He's not saying that, okay? Um, man is, we know from other verses in the Bible, from Jesus' own teachings, that man is just born into sin, right? We're sinful. He's saying here, they have no excuse. He says, when he says that um, in verse 22, but now they have no cloak for their sin, that idea of cloak is, is a covering. He's basically saying, look, I came and I personally spoke to them. And they still reject me and hate me and hate the Father. They have no excuse now. When they stand before God Almighty someday in judgment, they can't say, well, nobody ever told me. Jesus says, I spoke to them. I taught them. They heard me. They have no excuse anymore. They have no cloak, no covering for their sin. He had taught them and they refused to hear his words. How many times in the book of John already have we seen them claim to believe, but the more they hear him speak, the more they don't want to follow him. But not only his words, he says in verse 23, He that hateth me hateth my father also. If I had not done among them the works which no, none other man did, they had not had sin. 
but now have they both seen and hated both me and my father. First off, he says, they have no excuse because they've heard me speak. And then he goes a little further and he says, not only have they heard me speak, but they have seen me perform all of these great miracles that nobody else has been able to do. They have no excuse. He's also building up, by the way, this idea of they rejected me or hated me without a cause. He's saying, look, I came and I lived in this world and I spoke words of truth and I removed any excuse they had and they rejected me. Then I showed them miracles to show that I was from God, that I had proper authority, that I could do things no other man could do. And they rejected me. And they did it without cause. It's not just that they rejected Jesus Christ. Lots of people in this world have been rejected. Jesus Christ spoke to them words from heaven, truth, showed them what scripture meant. He came along and he showed his authority from God, did all these miracles, water into wine, walking on the water, feeding the 5,000, healing the lame, healing the blind, raising the dead. And yet they still hated him. They hated, you think about that. When Jesus Christ later says um, in verse 25, but this cometh to pass that the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. That's quoting Psalms, by the way. They hated me without a cause. They hated the one that could heal their sick. They hated the one that could turn water into wine and give them drink from nothing. They hated the one that could feed them. They hated the one that could sit and teach them wisdom. We're not talking about somebody that was mean to them, somebody that had nothing to give, somebody that was just out to get whatever he could get on his own. We're, he's saying, look, they hated me despite the fact that I taught them truth, despite the fact that I showed them all of these mighty works of God. They hated me anyways. Why did they hate him? Well, he told us earlier and in other places, I'm the light shining in a dark place. And natural man loves his darkness and he doesn't want the light so he's saying in these verses that I spoke to them I showed them mighty works I've taken away every excuse they have they have no excuse and that the prophecy might be fulfilled they hated me without a cause. That's in Psalms chapter 69 verse 4 I believe is where that's coming from. There's a couple places but I think it's this one personally. Psalms chapter 69 verse 4 They that hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of mine head. They that would destroy me being mine enemies wrongfully are mighty. Then I restored that which I took not away. They hated him without a cause. So by the way, I know it doesn't help much, but if they hate us because of our message, take comfort in the fact that it's not you. It's the one that you're bringing. It's the message you're bringing. It's the message of the Lord Jesus Christ that they hate. Take comfort in the fact that they hated him first. Take comfort in the fact that this is actually all part of the plan. The Lord knew before he ever come that they would hate him without a cause. The very fact that they hated him is actually that much more proof that he is who he says he is. They hated him without justification. They hated him. It wasn't founded in the fact that he was the just one, the true one, or any of that. They hated him because he shined a light on their sin. Now he, he kind of starts to, I say wrap up, he has a whole other chapter or two to go, but he's wrapping up this part of the conversation 
<coughs> excuse me, within verse 26. But when the Comforter is come, him I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. Now, this is a reminder. He's already told them multiple times in 14, uh, 13, 14, and 15 that he's sending a comforter, that he's going to send his peace, that he's going to send this comforter to be the one that opens their eyes and reveals truth to them and brings back all of the teachings that he had. That's the role that the comforter would bring. I think it's no mistake that at the end of telling them that the world's going to hate them and how much it's going to get bad, he says, but remember, I'm sending the comforter. This is not just some low-level angel that's coming to bring comfort. This is being sent straight from the Father, and it's the Spirit. We talked about the fact that this comforter is the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost, part of the Trinity, He's coming and He's going to dwell in us and He is going to be the Spirit of truth in us. And not only that, but the Holy Spirit is going to be a witness of the Father. Next chapter tells us, and we won't get into this much right now, next chapter tells us that the Holy Spirit is going to be the one that convicts the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. So, the Comforter is coming. He's going to come from the Father. The Comforter is going to be the Spirit of Truth, which will teach us all things. The, comfortable, the Comforter will be a witness. He's going to bring to mind the things that the disciples need to remember, the teaching and teaching them additional things and opening their eyes and convicting the world of sin. And then they personally, and I think by extension us, will be used as witnesses for Him too. Now, the apostles can say something that we can't say. It says in verse 27, And ye also shall bear witness, because ye have been with me from the beginning. The people that he's talking to, the apostles that he's talking to at this point, they're going to be filled with the Holy Ghost, and they're going to spread the gospel message across the whole known world. They are going to be the fulfillment of this verse right here. You that have been with me from the beginning... You saw me from the very beginning of my ministry and you've been with me all the way up until this time when I'm going to be crucified, buried, and raised again. You will be witnesses for me. Now we are also called to be witnesses. Now we can't claim that we were with Jesus Christ from the beginning of his ministry, but we have been given a command, been given a command to go proclaim the gospel message throughout the whole world. And so to that end, we do have that same command. We are to be witnesses for Him. Now, if you continue to go and we think about, well, what's coming? He said they're going to hate you and they're going to persecute you, but what does that mean? If I was one of the apostles hearing this, I don't know if I would want to know what that means, but the natural man would probably see, be saying, well, what, what kind of persecution? Are they going to make fun of us? What, what, what do you mean they're going to persecute us? So the what is coming and the why. Verse 16, or uh, chapter 16, verse 1. These things have I spoken unto you that ye should not be offended. Now understand something, guys. This word offended here is different than what we think of when we think of the word offended, right? When I use the word offended, uh, usually it means I said something and it offended you. It, it, it made you angry or, or it was an insult to you. That is not what he means here. This word offended in the context, when you look up the original word, it actually means to stumble or to fall or to be tripped up. Imagine that the Lord Jesus Christ, I mean, remember he said, I'm your friend. I'm not just your master. You're not just a servant. I'm your friend. I'm telling you everything that the Father has given me to tell you. He says, I want you to know what's coming. He's actually said that a few times in these chapters. And one time he even said, I'm telling you what's coming so that when it comes, you'll know that I am who I say I am and that you'll know that you can believe in me. You can, it's okay. Imagine you're the apostles. 
You've just heard all the stuff about him leaving. You've just heard how the world is going to hate you. And then he looks at you and he says, look, I'm giving you a heads up because when it happens, I don't want you to fall away. When it comes and it is coming, I don't want you to, to be faced with it and to trip up and to fall away. I don't want you to go, well, the Lord must have been wrong because I thought he was going to be a comforter. I thought he was sending somebody to give us peace. And now I'm getting persecuted. He says, look, I'm, I am sending a comforter and I am going to send you peace. But I also want you to know what's going to happen because I don't want you to fall away when it comes. So listen, if persecution comes to me and you, this same rule applies. It's easy to serve the Lord when things are good. But when bad things come, the Lord doesn't want us to be offended. And I don't mean offended like I've got my feelings hurt. I mean, He doesn't want us to, be, to trip up and to stumble and to fall away from following Him because we ran into a little bit of trouble. He doesn't want us to fall away. Persecution can come and probably will come at some point in your life because of a stand that you make for Him. When the whiplash and the backlash is bad, know they hated Him before they hated you. Know that He knew it was coming. Even know that He warned you it would come if you followed close enough to Him that it would come. Don't let it be something that causes you to fall away from following him. Verse 2, they will, they will, they shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God service. You know what comes to mind when I read that? And I realize that it's not the only thing. I think of Stephen. Stephen. Do you know Stephen in the Bible was trying to witness to the Lord and he got dragged out? Now I think this is actually saying that they put you out and, and there, there was a thing in the Jewish where there was two ways they could kick you out if I understand it. There was kind of like a light version of kicking you out and then there was the we're cutting you off from the Jewish faith. And that's basically what that's talking about. There's going to come a time when you preach my message, the people of the synagogues will kick you out and they will cut you off. In Stephen's case, when he preached the Lord Jesus Christ, they literally got so mad at him that they dragged him out and stoned him with stones. And we know that one of the people that was consenting to that was a guy by the name of Saul. And we are told that Saul, in his own words, said that he thought he was being zealous for God. Later on, when Paul himself was being judged, and he ties back to what he used to be before the Lord saved him, he tells us, I thought I was doing God a favor when I sat and watched Stephen being stoned. He then went on to drag people out of their houses and cast them in jail and consented probably to some additional deaths. Paul, or Saul, is a fulfillment of verse 2 of John chapter 16. When he consented to Stephen's death, he fulfilled verse 2. Now, I think it's happened many, many times since then. There have been some people that they have killed Christians because they hated Christianity. And they were not doing it for the zealousness of God. <laughs> the true God. And then there have been people who thought they were religious and thought they were really serving God Almighty. And in reality, they weren't. And we know that some of them were saved, like Saul. We know that some of them will stand before God one day and try to convince him that they did a lot for him. Well, look, we did this in your name, and we did that in your name, and we did this in your name, and he's going to say, get out of here, I don't even know who you are. Now, if you're an apostle, you've just been told that he's leaving. 
He's going to send a comforter. The world's going to hate you. And now he has clarified what he means by the world is going to hate you. You as a person that was born and raised in the Jewish faith and have probably followed the feasts and the festivals and have went to synagogue faithfully, they will run you out. And it will be an economic disaster. We don't always understand that. But lots of times when you were in a community like that, you got kicked out of the synagogue and you were cut off from the Jewish faith. It, it meant people probably didn't do business with you and, and you couldn't get a job. But there's a lot of stuff that goes in with that. He said it's going to get bad. And by the way, it's going to get so bad that there is going to come a time when people will kill you and they will say they did it in the name of God. That is what they're faced with when he is telling them, be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. Don't worry, I'm sending a comforter. Don't worry, I'm coming back for you someday. Multiple times he has told them those things in these chapters. And now he has said how far it's going to go, but the message is still the same. Be of good cheer, I've overcome. He doesn't want them to be surprised. He doesn't want them to be faced with this and find out that, be dismayed that this happened. It's coming. He says, it's coming. And here's what it's going to be. To some degree, as hard as this was, if you've read the writings of John and Peter and some of the other guys, you understand that these things were actually, I hesitate to say it this way, it was actually a comfort to them when they saw some of this stuff come to pass because it was just that much more of an evidence of Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, in Acts, um, Peter and John get called before the council and threatened and then they go back out and they get thrown in jail and eventually they get beaten and they walk away from that beating rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer for the cause of Christ. These were two men that sat and listened to this conversation. I have no doubt that when they walked away rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer for Christ, in my mind I have zero doubt that their minds were coming back to this conversation. Because he said, if they hate you, it's because they hate me. If they persecute you, it's because you're doing what I've asked you to do, and they hate me. They recognized that the persecution that they were suffering was because they were actually following Jesus Christ. And they took comfort in that. They took joy in that, that the Lord had counted them worthy to suffer for his cause. I'm not saying go out and look for persecution. There are people that have a persecution complex. They try to get you to persecute them, so they can claim persecution. That's not what I'm talking about. But when Peter and John simply went out and preached the same message that Jesus Christ did, and they got persecuted, they rejoiced in it. Now, how do you think they would have felt if they were beaten and thrown in prison, and Jesus Christ had said nothing to them about, this is coming and they're going to do it because I, because of me. That's where he's saying, look, I don't want you to stumble when it happens. They didn't stumble. They rejoiced. It wasn't that the comforter was going to... We need to understand this too. It wasn't that the comforter was going to be sent to keep bad things from happening to them. I think sometimes people get the wrong idea about Christianity, and sometimes it's because of the way we say it. Me and Tanya talked about this yesterday too. When you are saved, it's not that all of your problems go away and life is amazing all of a sudden. You're still faced with woes and sorrows and griefs and trials and troubles. Sometimes more because you're trying to do what's right. The comforter was not going to be sent to keep bad things from happening to them. The comforter was sent to open their eyes, to teach them truth, and to give them peace in the midst of what they were going through. 
the future for them was going to be rough. It was going to be hard. And we know that. Now we're basically out of time, so instead of getting into this last point, we'll save this for next week. But if you want to get ahead of the game, um, I would encourage you to read through the book of 1 Peter. Okay, We're going to talk about why are you being persecuted. And I'm going to go ahead and give you part of this, and then we'll talk about these verses next time. Some people make the mistake of thinking they can lay claim to all suffering being persecution because they're Christians. Every bad thing that's ever happened to me and every bad thing that ever will happen to me is because I'm one of Christ's. And therefore I can claim, lay claim to uh, this horrible thing happened to me because, because of Christianity. That is not what the Lord Jesus Christ said in this chapter. That is not what he said. There are times when suffering is because of chastisement. There are times because Jesus Christ is trying to teach us some things. And there are times where, I hate to tell you this, this world is in great anguish and sorrow because of sin, <laughs> and bad things happen. Jesus Christ here is specifically talking about if you are suffering because of the things that you do in His name. Do not take these passages and try to misuse them. I've literally read a book and talked to some people who said, you know, this and this and this happened and it's because, it's because of my Christian faith. Maybe, maybe not, right? Don't take what's in the Word and add to it. He is literally saying, if they persecute you because of my name, He did not say, well, because you were a jerk to somebody and they got mad at you and persecuted you, then you can lay claim that I can rejoice in the fact that that's because I'm following Christ. No. He says, when you carry my message, they will hate it and they will persecute you. So don't try to lay claim to something that's not there. What I'd encourage you to do, and just to get a little bit of homework, get ready for next week, um, ask yourself, am I suffering for Christ? And then read the book of 1 Peter. Now, there's going to be more in there than that topic, but I was surprised, honestly, at how much the book of 1 Peter deals with this topic. Uh, you see it in chapter 2, you see it in chapter 3, you see it in chapter 4. Um, so read over it if you get a chance, and I think you'll find that there's quite a bit about it in that book. All right. Let's go ahead and be dismissed um, with a song. Brother Philip, would you come and lead us, please?